Hey, 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 happy Monday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, incredibly enough, thegaminggang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard. Tonight is Monday, January 30th, 2023. This is live stream number 880. Yowza. Closing in on episode 900. Hey, and that's on top of the other videos I shoot too. Quite a few. So welcome aboard. If this is your first time hanging out, let me point out, super, super casual around here. We are certainly not partaking in any sort of rocket surgery by any stretch of the imagination. Just talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news and then taking a look at a tabletop game. And tonight will be no different because we are going to be diving on in to take a first look at the collected populated hexes monthly the first year from Third Kingdom Games. So this is a bit of a hex crawl, obviously enough. And it is for old school Renaissance titles and in particular old school essentials. So we're going to be diving on into this in just a bit. Plus, I will actually have a little bonus as well. So stay tuned. Of course, if you're not overly familiar with this stream, let me point out to you that we do tackle the tabletop gaming news first. So if you are tuning in live because you want to check out the populated Hexes Monthly the first year, I do want to let you know it'll probably be about 35, maybe 40 minutes before we start jumping on in. So if you're watching live, just kick back, put your feet up, relax, enjoy yourself. But if you watch this 30 minutes or more after the stream ends, there will be timestamps. So if you are an impatient type and you want to get right on into that first look, you'll be able to do so. Those timestamps are located in the show notes. And depending on what device you might happen to be using, it'd be right there in the timeline, right in front of your nose. So make it uh, fairly convenient for you. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com. For all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Also, this is live stream, so that means there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you happen to be a subscriber to the channel, for 48 hours or more, then you will certainly be able to take part in chat. So if you want to say howdy, maybe you've got a question, a comment, by all means, chime in. I will do my best to respond. So first out the gate today is the Motor City Madman. Yes, the Madman is with us. He is one of our chat moderators, as is Flaming Huron, who is also with us in chat. Straight Kismet has joined us. Christopher Rush is also hanging out, too. So the Madman says, no rocket surgery. Did I join the wrong live stream? Yes. The, uh, the live rocket surgery stream is, I think, three or four uh, pages over from the gaming gang. So 
So yes, we we do not do any rocket surgery. I am anti-rocket surgery. I know it's a little strange, but that's that's how I am. That's the side of the coin I come down on. All right, got uh, a jam-packed show for you tonight. So without further ado, let's jump on into the news. Because arriving in February from Lookout Games, Lookout Games! or just Lookout Games, is a deluxe anniversary edition of Agricola. Here's the skinny on Agricola 15. Agricola, the modern board game classic. Almost 15 years ago, Uwe Rosenberg and Hanno Gierke introduced us to the farm. Yes, Agricola has become one of the most popular board games of our time. In 2016, we completely revamped the base game and incorporated many improvements. This past October at Spiel 22 in Essen, the time had come. It's now time to celebrate 15 years of Agricola. High time for a real anniversary edition, one that every Agricola fan, collector, and future fan will love. We've packed the XXL box for you, or double extra large, with the complete Agricola basic game, which is that revised new edition, which came out in 2016, promotional items that have long since been sold out, some fine new products, and you thought you had all of those L deck cards, as well as a sophisticated inlay for quick assembly. Clemens Franz has made sure that the anniversary box also cuts an excellent figure on the shelf. Celebrate 15 years of Agricola with this limited anniversary edition. Agricola 15 is for one to four players, ages 14 and up. Plays in around 90 minutes, although whenever I've played, it's been more than 90 minutes. It's going to carry an MSRP of $139.95 when it arrives next month. As Christopher Rush says, hell, I just like saying Agricola. So I have played Agricola a few times. Uh, in fact, I even have the app game on my iPad. Although, I've had, you know, and the funny thing is, I've had it for years, and I've only played it a handful of times on the iPad. I think I've played it more in person with my best friend, Elliot Miller, and we always call it Agricola. Kind of like that. Ricola. Yeah, we have problems. There's something very, very wrong with us. So cool. So we get a new 15th anniversary edition. It is a huge box. That is one big box. That looks like it's about at least like two and a half times the depth of the standard Agricola box. And it is designed to hold everything that has been produced to this point. Now, it's not all included in this, but from my understanding, this box has been designed to hold everything that's been released for the revised edition, as well as future expansions as well. I like Agricola. I think it's a pretty cool game. Uh, a little tricky to play well at least in my opinion. And I certainly do not think I play Agricola very well. I got to say, I don't think I've ever won it. Uh, I mean, I've won playing it on the app, but now I've, I've never actually won it playing in person. Moving right along, currently up on Kickstarter for Wise Wizard Games is Hero Realms Dungeons. Here's the scoop. The adventure begins. If you're new to Hero Realms, Dungeons is a fantastic place to start. In this single box, you'll get all the amazing gameplay Hero Realms has to offer. Wise Wizard Games, the makers of Star Realms, officially launched the new Hero Realms Dungeons and six new character classes on Kickstarter this past week. The Kickstarter exceeded all expectations and has brought in more funding than any other Wise Wizard Games Kickstarter in its first week. 
Hero Realms is based off of Star Realms, which has won seven Game of the Year awards. It expands upon the popular deck building engine with a fantasy theme and adds elements of an RPG, including the ability to acquire skills and treasures and level up your character as you play through the campaign. With Hero Realms Dungeons, we're excited to offer solo, competitive, and cooperative play with new characters in a 12-encounter dungeon campaign all in a single box, said Rob Doherty, CEO of Wise Wizard Games. We've been pre-marketing this campaign for quite some time. Players have been clamoring for this announcement. We delayed the campaign to align with our new strategy of launching Kickstarters much later in our product development cycle, said Debbie Moynihan, COO of Wise Wizard Games. And I've actually interviewed both of them. It's been a while. It was like Origins, so right there, you know. It's been a while since I have not gone to Origins the past few years. For those new to Hero Realms, Dungeons is a fantastic place to start. Experienced players are even more thrilled about this massive amount of new content. There is a short Kickstarter video. I actually had to trim this. I'll explain why after you give it a peek. Let's kick back and give it a look. Hi, I'm Rob Doherty, CEO of Wise Wizard Games. Whether you're a longtime Hero Realms fan or you've never played a deck building game before, you are going to love Hero Realms Dungeons. Hero Realms is a super popular deck building game based on Star Realms, winner of seven Game of the Year awards. It gets tons of play because it's super easy to learn, quick to set up, and you can easily play multiple times in a single game session. Dungeons combines all the best elements of Hero Realms in a single box with solo, PvP, and cooperative play. You can play two to four player PvP with the all new 80 card market deck and four standard starting decks. You can also play as a savage barbarian or a brilliant alchemist. Pit them against each other head to head or have them each lead a team in a six player game. These characters each have unique starting decks and flavorful powers they can use during the game. With 24 additional skill and ability tree cards and 40 treasure cards, you'll be able to play legacy style PvP where you level up after every game, customizing your character as you bring them all the way from level one to level 24. And best of all, you can adventure solo or as a team with the included Dungeons of Thandar 12 encounter cooperative campaign. Battle mighty monsters, find magical treasures, level up and improve your skills. If you want additional characters for your PvP battles or adventuring party, back at the adventure tier and you'll also get the bard, druid, monk, and kickstarter exclusive necromancer. Each has a unique starting deck and all the treasure and skill cards needed to bring them up to level 24 and play in any Hero Realms campaign. And of course we have tons of cool kickstarter exclusive promo cards ready to be unlocked as we knock out those stretch goals. Thank you for watching, and on behalf of the whole Wise Wizard Games team, thank you for your support. We love making these games, and we couldn't do it without you. Your adventure awaits. Press the green button. Back now. The Hero Realms Dungeons Kickstarter has already passed the one half million dollar funding mark. For Wise Wizard Games, you can reserve a copy of the core game for a $59 pledge through February 16th. Expected delivery on this project is February of next year. So we, so there, of course, are various different pledge levels involved as well. So keep that in mind. I like Hero Realms. I like Hero Realms better than Star Realms. I don't know why. I think part of it is having played a variety of deck building games. For some reason, it just jives with me better going and like rehiring mercenaries, you know, cards that have gone into your discard or whatever, as opposed to like rebuilding space stations and that with the same names i don't know it's it's just it's just very weird but this actually i have 
a card box which contains my hero realms. I don't have everything for it, but I've got I've got some of the characters, some of the character classes, which we actually usually don't play with. Anyway, I was going to say it stays in the back seat of my car because it is pretty popular with the gang. And every once in a while, especially my nephew Cameron, he'll ask, hey, Jeff, you want to play some Hero Realms? I'm like, yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Kathy Evans is with us in chat. Good to see you, Kathy. Welcome aboard. Christopher says it's nice having some wise wizards around. Flaming Huron points out, hopefully you didn't trim it for the music. Yes, I did. I actually had to cut the first minute, about minute five seconds of that video because it was all music and it was sharing a lot of the, the images, of course, for the game. And I always upload videos first. If it's a Kickstarter video or anything like that, I upload that. Even the intermission videos, I upload those just to make sure that I don't get flagged for a copyright violation. And sure enough, I got flagged for a copyright violation for the first minute, five seconds of the Kickstarter video. So I figured, ah, it's a little more than three minutes. I'll just trim that on off. So there you have that. A little disappointing to see that uh, this will take a year to get out there. I will mention, if you go and check out the Kickstarter, there is, uh, there's some stretch goals that they share, some uh, some images, and they're they're using like pe real people. Oh, some of the artwork looks awful. <laughs> Got to be honest. Some of it is like, oh, I, I I really hope that's not that's not the finished product there because it looks so much different. Facially, it's all, it's all the face. But they, all, it, they look really, really different than the other artwork that they're using for this game. So my fingers are crossed. That, that will not be the finished art. Let's move on into some role-playing game news because hitting stores in February is the crypt of the Devil Lich. It's for both Dungeon Crawl Classics and 5e. Here's the skinny from Goodman Games. Goodman Games is proud to announce the re-release of one of its most cherished dungeon crawl classics, The Crypt of the Devil Lich. Updated and converted for both 5e and the Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game rule sets, this classic death trap dungeon was inspired by the dreaded Tomb of Horrors. The heroes are sent into the Devil Lich's crypt to destroy her before she can return to power, as foreseen in a prophecy. However, the unknowing heroes have actually been tricked into entering her crypt to free her from her prison. If they are truly heroes, they will uncover the deception and defeat the evil Devil Lich before she can unleash her dark designs on the surface world. This adventure module is a conversion the classic dungeon module, Dungeon Crawl Classics number 13, The Crypt of the Devil Lich, originally published in 2004 by Goodman Games. The Crypt of the Devil Lich was truly a unique design, an homage to the classic meat grinder style trap filled dungeons popular in the late 70s and early 80s. The original adventure was designed for the 2004 first annual Gen Con Dungeon Crawl Classics team tournament, a tradition that continues today. With some effort on a GM's part, the adventure can be used for campaign play. Crypt of the Devil Lich is going to be available in two flavors, 5e and DCC. You can order each, which will include the PDF, for $40, or you can wait for them to hit stores on February 16th. So here's the thing. It looks to me that Goodman Games is actually charging far less than the MSRP of online retailers for this. 
I have seen it at other uh, online retailers for between $54 and $56. And you won't get the PDF. So did want to mention, mention that. Of course, first time the Crypt of the Devil Lich was released, that would have been for 4th edition D&D. And I got to say, I am not a fan of Tomb of Horrors. I think I have mentioned that a few times before. I think it is a pile of shit. <laughs> I know there are a lot of people out there who look back fondly on that adventure. And to me, it's just one of these. It's, I am not, I'm not a fan of tournament dungeons because they all... I've never seen a tournament dungeon that felt organic. It's all just like a, a fun house or for the most part, a house of horrors. <laughs> so blame me here and says, tell us how you really feel, Jeff. I am. I am telling you. Now keep in mind, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about tomb of horrors. So please keep that in mind. Something else I find kind of interesting and you can go and check on the gaminggang.com because there was a news piece about this. I think this kick started. If I remember correctly, they have changed the cover art. They've changed the cover art for the 5e edition because the original cover art was far more sexually suggestive than what's on there now. So I was like, uh huh. Well. Let's see. So, uh, Strike Kismet says, Dungeon Crawl Classic, Devil Lich, I cast Run! Coco B says, hey, spoilers for an almost 20-year-old module. Yes, Coco B is with us. Roger Pruholm is with us as well as Shaz. So thanks for swinging on in, hanging out with us tonight. So... I am hoping at some point, so I'm going to talk about conventions uh, after the news before we jump on into our brief intermission, but I'm going to Gary Khan with my best friend, Elliot, and I'm hoping to actually be able to chat with folks from Goodman Games because I think it's kind of silly that they don't, they're not involved with anybody. As far as, you know, providing coverage, you, you almost never see people sharing video coverage of their products. And, you know, I, I like sharing news about Goodman Games. Pretty much most of the stuff I've, I've shared reviews of that had been purchased by me or given to me from Entities outside of being Goodman Games, I have enjoyed. So I, I never get an opportunity to really kind of sit down and, and try to hammer something out. And we almost were there. We, we were kind of on the cusp. And then that just, you know, it just didn't happen. Nobody, nobody uh, made a final decision on anything. So hopefully... One day, we will actually get Goodman Games on board with the gaming gang. Our friend Chen from Taiwan is with us. Welcome aboard. Let's move on to some more role-playing game news, because now available in print from author Sean Tompkins and Modifius Entertainment is Iron Sworn Starforged. Here's the dope. In Ironsworn Starforged, for some reason that just doesn't roll off the tongue. Ironsworn Starforged. You are a space-born hero sworn to undertake perilous quests. You will explore uncharted space, unravel the secrets of a mysterious galaxy, and build bonds with those you meet on your travels. Most importantly, you will swear iron vows and see them fulfilled, no matter the cost. Starforged is a standalone follow-up to the Iron Sworn tabletop role-playing game. Experience with Iron Sworn is not required to play. 
Starforge builds on Iron Sworn's award-winning innovations to chart a path to an exciting new frontier. There are three ways to play. Guided. One or more players take the role of the characters while a guide, GM, moderates the session. There's co-op. You and one or more friends play to overcome challenges and complete quests, and there's no guide required. Or solo, where obviously enough you would portray as lone character driven to fulfill vows in a dangerous galaxy. Good luck. So what's included? Story-driven mechanics put your character at the center of their quest-driven adventures. Inspiring campaign launch exercises to build your setting, create your character, and set off into a universe of perils and opportunities. Creative prompts to eliminate game prep and push your adventures forward with or without a GM. System agnostic generators for on-the-fly discoveries of space-born locations, planets, settlements, people, creatures, starships, foreboding derelicts, ancient alien vaults, and more! It's quite a lot already. There's also extensive advice, examples, and options for exploring the story of your characters and their fateful vows. The 406-page hardcover carries an MSRP of $46.99. That is if you order it from Modifius Entertainment, which I believe will also score you the PDF. Or you can grab the PDF alone, which has been out for some time. Over at Drive Through RPG for $20. Gotta say, artwork for this looks stellar. No pun intended. Very nice. I, I'm kind of curious if Modifius Entertainment is also at some point going to release Iron Sworn. Well, so there's two fantasy Iron Sworns. I think one is Iron Sworn Delve. And I believe that's solitaire. I'm not, I'm not positive because I'm I have shared news about Iron Sworn previously uh, when it was uh, just being published by Sean Tompkins uh, and Modifius didn't have anything to do with it. And for some reason, and I might be absolutely wrong, I thought I thought this was a powered by the apocalypse game. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but for some reason, I thought it had something to do with that. I might be absolutely wrong, like I said. It might be its own thing. All right, so. Uh, Coco B says, hi, all. It's nice and warm in the duct tape studios. Oh, is it? You must be hanging out in a different duct tape studio. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Straight deadly outside, yes. A lot of areas in the U.S. are getting hammered. We're just cold. In fact, funny enough, we were, what, two nights ago? The news, the weather was, oh, everybody's like, oh, five or six inches of snow. And thankfully, we did not get it. We got a light dusting. And then last night, at least I don't think I had encountered it, there was no discussion of any snow. And we got a, a little more than a light dusting, but it was still almost nothing. So I was very happy about that. Although tonight and for the next few days, it's going to be very, very cold. Coco B says, fingers crossed as far as Goodman Games. Lots of Goodman Games fans here. Which leads me to something that I will mention after we finish up with the news. Because it's something I think I think some of you out there who watch, you do this, and others don't. And it, it's one of the ways that we get far more companies on board, uh, the gaming gang. So Christopher Rush says, this looks uh, very interesting, even though it's a little hard to say. Well, it's not hard to say. It just doesn't roll off the tongue. But they do like those system agnostic tables. Always a nice touch. I think that's one of the reasons why um, Kevin Crawford's work is so popular. Stars Without Number and Worlds Without Number is because 
their toolkits as well as game systems. So you can use a lot of what's in them with other role-playing games, and this looks to be the case here too. Roger says they've been snow blowing snow for three days in a row where they are. Yuck. Uh, Lord Cost 2000 is with us in chat. Howdy, howdy. I think I've said hello to everybody so far in chat. Final news piece. Explorer Chivalry and Sorcery 5th Edition from Britannia Game Designs with the new basic rules release. Here's what I know. For those who fight and those who pray. For those who toil and those who enchant. These basic rules are intended to give an introduction into chivalry and sorcery with a stripped back character creator. Uh, I should say stripped back character generation. I almost said creation, but that's not what it says. So we get chapter one, an introduction, which starts out with the scope of the book, briefly covers what a role-playing game is. Then we get the basic game mechanics, which are the nuts and bolts of the chivalry and sorcery system. There's character generation, which breaks down the three steps of the character creation process, from choosing your social class to choosing a vocation. There's skills with information on over 50 different skills. Combat and spell casting revolves around the 15 second combat round and the spending of action points to carry out actions. This chapter also covers spell casting. Then we've got magic, which tackles learning spells and practicing magic. Spells are categorized in 10 different groups from elemental magic to wards and everything in between. There are clerical acts of faith, which details, you guessed it, acts of faith that clerics can call upon. There's a bestiary with a collection of creatures you can use in your adventures, as well as equipment, and it'll wrap up with discussion about level advancement and awarding experience. The 76-page Chivalry and Sorcery Basic Rules are available in PDF right now over at Drive Through RPG for a dollar ninety nine. So there you have it. We have discussed chivalry and sorcery in the past, and once again, I'll be the first to admit I do not know the system, but I had always been under the impression that it is one of the crunchiest of the role-playing games that are out there. And it is it is a medieval role-playing game. Now, granted, it is fantasy, but I think you can run it if you just wanted to, to have a medieval role-playing game. You can do that as well. So keep that in mind. We'll point out, if I were the fine folks over at Britannia Game Designs, I would actually go get me a web domain as opposed to using <laughs> that that uh, web address, just me. I don't know. I it's funny. I actually tell publishers all the time that you know, because a lot of times you'll you'll see a small publisher and their website is like WordPress dot and it's like, don't do that. Don't do that. For one, don't make it easier for hackers to jump on into your site. And yes, it's not difficult to figure out what, what content management system is being used for a website, but don't advertise it. Plus, to me, maybe it's just me, but I don't know. I don't think it speaks well for your company if you can't afford spending like $18 on a domain name every year. I mean, I work on a shoestring budget, and we still have thegaminggang.com and have for, you know, 13 years now. Fleming Heron says it's laziness. It might be that. I've, like, once again, it just, it, it does not speak well. Just like when you see a Kickstarter, every once in a while, somebody will send me info about a Kickstarter that I'm like, oh, that doesn't look so bad. Maybe I'll share news about that. And I go, look at their website, and it's like, 
you don't even have a website, you're on Facebook. No, sorry, not sharing your news. Sorry. Anyway, I don't mean to pick on Britannia game designs. I'm just throwing this out there. I'm just mentioning that. Speaking of mentioning, I was just talking about drive through RPG. Don't forget the gaming gang. Thus, Dispatch is affiliated with the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit, say, drive through RPG to take advantage of that $1.99 chivalry and sorcery, by all means, please stop by the GamingGang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do help add up and keep the GamingGang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you find the GamingGang.com to be a valuable resource, hell, if you just like what we do. You can always swing on over to paypal.me slash the gaming gang. I will throw that out there one more time for you. And making a small donation. And thankfully, there are quite a few people out there who use either or or both uh, the drive through RPG banners. And they stop by paypal.me. So thank you very much, everybody. Really, and I'm not joking. I mean, it really does help keep the website around. It really does. So thank you. All right. Anyway, so a few things I do want to talk about before we jump on into taking a look at Populated Hexes Monthly, the first year from Third Kingdom Games. A variety of different things. First of all, I mentioned this. I said I'll, I would mention this uh, a little more in depth when we got past the news because it was pointed out. So as an example, letting companies know about the gaming gang. Believe it or not, people like yourselves out there contacting a game company saying, hey, you know, I purchased XYZ game. I saw it on the gaming gang. Jeff talked about it on one of the live shows. I saw a review from the gaming gang, whatever. Actually goes a long way. It really, really does. And I've said this before. A lot of companies out there, they don't necessarily know where their sales come from. They just know, oh, hey, we got, we got some sales. Right? So it always helps out to... Uh, mention that. Plus, if there are companies out there, so like Coco B said, oh, you know, fingers crossed about Goodman Games. You contacting Goodman Games and saying, hey, you know, you really should work with the gaming gang. You should really check out some of his reviews because, for one, I have reviewed Goodman Games releases. So, uh, that goes way further than me sitting there going, well, you know, I don't really review PDFs and doing video reviews of PDFs is kind of boring because that's where we kind of left off on that. They were kind of like, well, you know, maybe we could send you a PDF once in a while. And it was sort of like, I, I don't want to go through that extra work to review a PDF and shoot video for it. That's PDFs are my correspondence. They tackle PDFs, not me. And Sammy Uhas does a wonderful job reviewing PDFs. Heck, we got a, a few reviews up at the end of uh, last week. Talk about that a bit as well. So anyway, so that's pretty much all I'm saying is when the consumer reaches out to a game company, that means something. Now, when it's me reaching out to a game company, depending on the game company, and if they even know about the gaming gang or myself or anything like that, uh, they're usually thinking, oh, this guy, he wants something. Which a lot of times I don't. I'm just touching base. So Flaming Heron says, hopefully you're getting a bunch of nickels, dimes, and quarters from their purchases. Uh, yeah, we're, you know, I've said it before, every month, Drive-Thru RPG, well, I should say the one bookshelf sites, because 
it's not just drive through RPG. It's also Dungeon Masters Guild and Storyteller Vault and Wargame Vault, things like that. It pays for the hosting to the website. And I, I guess some people think I'm knocking GoDaddy by saying this, which I'm not. I actually worked for GoDaddy way back in the day when they were a damn good company to work for out in Arizona, when most companies out in Arizona were not good companies to work for. Um, I say it all the time. We don't have that cheapo $3 GoDaddy hosting because we wouldn't be able to handle the kind of traffic that we get over at thegaminggang.com. A lot of people don't realize how popular the website actually is. I know a lot of people who watch the videos don't visit thegaminggang.com, but there are far more people who visit thegaminggang.com who don't watch any of the videos. So, Batman says they uh, picked up a couple of things yesterday from Drive Through RPG. Very cool. Very, very cool. All right, moving right along. Uh, Gen Con passes went on sale yesterday. So if you are thinking of going to Gen Con, I always recommend it. It's my favorite convention out of any convention I go to, bar none. Now, I haven't gone to every convention out there, right? But I always have a blast at Gen Con. And the people at Gen Con are just fantastic. I have never had any issues with anybody at Gen Con, any attendee or anything like that. Everybody's always having a good time. Everybody's always friendly. I'm a friendly guy anyway when I'm out and about, so it's usually reciprocated. But I just, I love it. I just love it. So Elliot Miller and I will be covering Gen Con once again. Hopefully Elliot's son Brian goes and either my brother Greg and, or my nephew Cameron goes this year as well. But what I was going to say is uh, if you are going to be attending Gen Con, reach out because we're always looking for people to, you know, play some games with or, you know, sit back, have dinner and a few adult beverages at night. So by all means, if you're planning on going to Gen Con, touch base. Maybe we'll get together and, and uh, enjoy an adult beverage or play a game. So we're also going to be at San Diego Comic-Con, and I am going to go with Elliot up to Gary Con for the first time. So I know next month they will release the events. So he and I got to get on the same page as far as what we're going to try to sign up for. So, yes, very cool. Man Man says they're going to go to Dragon Con. Yeah, you always go to Dragon Con. You're always like, oh, I'm going to Gen Con next year. Never show up. Don't lie. Gen Con is far closer to you. <laughs> yes. Lastly, I don't know. Uh, no spoilers whatsoever. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you watched the latest episode of The Last of Us last night. Damn good episode. That, that was very, very good. I am I'm very impressed three episodes in on what HBO has done with this series because the video game was unlike anything else, too. It, it could be very emotional in that video game and really, really like what uh, the fine folks over at HBO have done with The Last of Us. You know, there are people out there talking about, oh, it might, might be the best episode of television in 2023. I, I don't know about that, especially since we're only in January. But it was good. It certainly was good. And it, it really... I think the thing about The Last of Us on HBO... Not only have they been pretty, well, okay, last night they did deviate from the video game story, but I was expecting it to be like a lot of, you know, oh, episode, or every episode's got tons of action in it, and, you know, kind of a zombie 
sort of show. I was a little concerned that it was just going to be like, oh, yeah, okay. So it's like, even though the game isn't like it, but it was kind of like, yeah, it's a little bit like, yeah, Walking Dead. So, anyway, Christopher Rush says, yeah, HBO changed how in the game, Joel dies every 20 minutes. That was a bold change. Well, that was only with Christopher's edition of The Last of Us. Some of us didn't see Joel die more than once every 90 minutes. <laughs> hey, man says they're enjoying The Last of Us. Third episode was damn good. Lord Cost 2000 says they just picked up the chivalry and sorcery. You'll have to let me know. Because I, I know you pop into chat every once in a while. You'll have to let me know. Is it as crunchy as I've heard it's supposed to be? Because that's what's kind of kept me away from checking out Chivalry and Sorcery. Is Like I said, I have always heard that it is the crunchiest of the fantasy role-playing games that are out there. Okay, so there you have it. We're going to jump on in to take a peek at populated hexes monthly from third kingdom games in just a few moments but first i think it's time for a brief intermission it's intermission time folks time out for a delicious snack in our sparkling refreshment building every item of fresh appetizing taste treat from the king of beers live life every golden minute of it enjoy Budweiser every golden drop of it cold golden Budweiser Budweiser sure Wilkins coffee? No. Oh, things just seem to happen to people who don't drink Wilkins. Once there was a glamorous movie star who did the most marvelous things. A little girl named Shirley Temple. She had a pony to play with. Drove her own car. She was so beautiful, Ideal has made a doll that looks just like her, a Shirley Temple doll. Same dimples, same golden curls you can really shampoo. And when you kiss her, her skin feels almost real. Your Shirley Temple doll comes all dressed up and just loves to have tea parties with her very own Shirley Temple tea set. 
Wouldn't you like to have a Shirley Temple doll? You can. She's waiting for you at your favorite toy store, along with the Shirley Temple tea set with Shirley Temple's picture or monogram on every piece. She's a wonderful doll. She's ideal. I'm the Shirley Temple doll, and I'm going to kill you. I, I have to kind of chuckle with that commercial because at that point in time when that commercial came out, and I do not have an exact year, I'm guessing less, uh, it's probably late 50s, maybe even early 60s. I'm guessing late 50s. Shirley Temple would have been pushing 30. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm sure there are probably people out there watching and are like, who, who, who's Shirley Temple? Anyway, regardless, she was really, really huge in the 30s as a small child. And I have to laugh because I've read that there were all these sort of, I don't know, like myths about her. These rumors about her, uh, one was that, you know, it was a wig. Those curls were a wig, which I guess uh, later in life, Shirley Temple said, I wish it had been a wig because all the crap they, you know, I had to go through uh, just to get the curls and the, the crap every night. But my favorite is that she was accused of not being a little girl, that she was a dwarf. You can look this up. This is true. She was accused of being a dwarf, and the Vatican actually dispatched an agent to the United States to investigate if Shirley Temple was a little girl or not. It's like, what? The more you know. So tonight, I am going to be diving on in and taking a first look at Populated Hexes Monthly, the first year from Third Kingdom Games. It's written by Todd Labak, and this 171-page softcover will carry an MSRP of $30.95. It's also available in hardcover, for $35.95. It's, they're not out yet. This successfully kickstarted, so uh, backers are getting their copies right now. But you can also get the PDF over at Drive-Thru RPG for $18.95. As a bonus, we're actually going to first take a look at the introduction to Absalom, which is free in PDF over at Drive-Thru RPG. And it is also included free if you order the first year for Populated Hexes Monthly. Also do want to mention that the latest Populated Hexes Monthly will arrive on February 1st. And you can subscribe. You can get physical copies over a 12-month period for $81.95. Or if you just want to get a subscription for the PDFs, you can do so for a year for $23.95. Let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the introduction to Absalom. So this is not like 50 pages or anything. It looks like it might be about 20 pages. And of course, the fine folks over at Third Kingdom Games were kind enough to provide me with these review copies. But keep in mind, neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the Gaming Gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. These days, it's important that you know that. So we've got some hex crawling rules discussing the map and scale. It says the world of Absalom is one of constant change. And of course, 
not to be confused with the city of Absalom, which is on the world of Galarian for Pathfinder. This is its own game world. So it's one of constant change where law and chaos are more than abstract philosophical ideas, but are instead metaphysical realities that shape the very world itself. Absalom is dominated by cycles, each lasting between two to 400 years. Each cycle is divided into an apex, when law holds sway and a nadir, when chaos sweeps over the lands, driving back the light of civilization. So we get our campaign setting. And each of these hexes that we're going to take a look at are six miles in uh, width. So here we've got Western Absalom. So on this, it's saying that one hex is 24 miles on the bigger map. So it says, no demi-humans. The astute or longtime reader of these supplements will note that demi-humans are not part of the implied setting of Absalom. Elves, dwarves, gnomes, and the like exist, certainly, but are not standard playable races. Which is kind of an old-school thing, at least an OSR thing for some systems. Some systems, let's see, off the top of my head, uh, if I remember correctly, it's either Adventure Conqueror King or Hyperborea that really, I mean, those races do exist, but they're not, they don't exist for player characters. You play as humans. So it says, instead of demi-humans, Epsilon is populated by a number of races of animal folk. Inspired by the 17th century artist Charles Lebrun and the current work of the RPG author John Stater, the various Falcon of Absalom are meant to fill the demi-human niche. And then we've got some small images of these animal folk. But they aren't anthropomorphic animals. So they, they are humans, humanoid, but they do look like they've got some characteristics of animals. So discussion of the planes. Talking about fairy, goblin, aklo, giant, draconic. Are these languages? Yeah, I think that is the languages there. Of course, as we take a look at the populated hexes monthly the first year, obviously enough, you can use these in any, any sort of uh, setting or campaign. You don't necessarily have to place them. Uh, you don't even have to place them the way they're placed uh, in the system itself on the maps. So... Flaming Heron says, so furries replace demi-humans? I, I don't think so. I mean, the thing is, you really probably can't make out this artwork all that well. But they're, certain, they're, they're not, like I said, they're not anthropomorphic animals. They are, they are human. They look human, but they have, you know, kind of aspects of animals. Maybe we'll see more of that when we jump on into the first year here. So this is, once again, this is the introduction to the game world. Looks like it's a bit of an introduction as well to uh, populated hexes and using the hexes. So we're going to jump on in here. Keep in mind, we're not going to look at each and every page. But I do want to give you a good feel for what's in here. And we're going to have a dozen different hexes. And I think, on average, I think the populated hexes probably run about 12, 13 pages. So, Tessie Trekkie is with us in chat. So is Kevin R. Smith. I don't think I said hi to Kevin. 
so we, we've got our table of contents. Here's our uh, Western Absalom. Once again, we saw this in the other book, talking about the different areas. So, so we have an area two. We had four issues devoted to that. And we have area 25, the Plateau of Lang. We had four issues devoted to that. And then area 32, the Frozen Wastes. So we have four hexes, issues, devoted to that as well. So we're going to get into information about the Western Plains. So we get our first hex. So it's showing us this is the hex here. And the Shrine of Jothog is what's located here. So each hex is going to have something interesting. At least one thing interesting. Uh, I think sometimes it could be like a dungeon, could be like a village, could be a city or town. So it's telling us what resources are available there. So we get located on the western edge of what is known as the Kuzir Flats. This hex borders the Diaz Channel and largely comprises flat coastal desert. The subhexes adjacent. So we do see we've got these subhexes within this hex. Uh, the subhexes adjacent to the water are hillier, the sand mounted in low ridge dunes, but the entire hex, like the flats themselves, is sand intermixed with smaller, smallish, I should say, rocks that prevent large dunes from forming. There is no potable water in this hex. The adjacent channel is teeming with fish. That must be the channel right there. But it's also shallow and possesses dangerous shoals that many a boat has run aground or sunk against. So we're getting our background here. And then in the subhexes, so in 06.06, .06, This is what's located there. Then 0405, which is over here. We're going to break down here. It's the Caves of Doathog. So then we get a map of these caves. Let <laughs> me hear it says hexes within hexes within hexes. All right, so then we get uh, basically a breakdown. We get a little, little breakdown of what's in the caves. I like the artwork. The artwork's pretty cool. Now, keep in mind, I think this was like the first issue. So we get a little appendix here, which we've got a new magic item. Then it's discussing nodes of chaos. Arcane Magic Expanded. So it looks like not only do we get some items of interest, some places of interest, it appears we get some optional rules as well. The spells of the Universal Grammary. And notes on spells. Once again, this is uh, designed for Old School Essentials. It's Old School Essentials compatible which basically means it is compatible with pretty much any OSR retro clone that's out there and wouldn't probably take a whole lot of work to convert it over to other systems as well. This looks really interesting. I like this. I, but the thing is, I'm also, I'm a fan of hex crawls. I like hex crawls. I would not run a, an entire campaign based on a hex crawl. So I also find the concept of a West March campaign to be interesting, but I'm, I'm not super 
familiar with them and just the concept where it's, to my knowledge, it's a campaign. It's, it's an area. So you've, well, it would be a map, right? Uh, and it's kind of like a shared locale. So it's not just one game master and their players on this map. It's other game masters and other players too. And they're all, you know, changing the game world. So, like I said, in theory, sounds really, really cool. But in practice, I don't know how well those get pulled off. So, Flaming Heron says, I know someone who loves hex maps as well as Stray Kismet. They like the idea of hexes due to being in the miniature gameplay, but not so much into them as maps. I don't mind them for maps. Uh, especially, it, it to me at least, uh, in a lot of ways, it makes figuring out you know movement pretty easy. So we got the entrance to the Valley of Kings. Once again, I don't want to sit here and look at each and every page here. Once again, I do want to give you an idea. So it looks like it's like the second issue, and then of course we got a little bar here telling us what issue this is looks like we've got undead and it looks like we've got undead once again for issue three so we do know the first four issues were taking place uh to the south so you have a wandering monsters table above ground skeletons 1d20 Whoa, hey, that's not balanced, man. That's not a balanced encounter. Stray Kismet had said, I want to sign up. I love hex maps. Well, once again, as I mentioned, uh, I don't believe this is, you know what? Maybe it is on, I think it is on the Third Kingdom Games website for you to order. But they've got a lot of stuff, actually. Uh, I'll show you. There's some other things from Third Kingdom Games we're going to look at next week. So this, because uh, they don't only do populated hexes monthly. I think that's probably what they're best known for. Oh, we got a Gripply Village. That's cool. Let's see. Do we get a map of it? Oh, there we go. Map right there. Here's the map of the Gripply Village. So this would have been uh, issue four. So we've got the keyed map there. So it says, the southern and western edges of this hex are bordered by hilly grasslands, which gradually become wooded, and the air wetter and more fecund until the hills are covered in temperate rainforest. Visibility in the hex is reduced by 25% due to the trees, which form a dense canopy that effectively prevents most direct sunlight from reaching the ground. Sweet! Oh, and then, okay, so... Because remember, this is designed for old-school essentials. So... As it, like I said, it looks like we get optional rules in each of these uh, monthly releases. And here we've got the Gripply races class. So if you wanted to play as uh, a Gripply, you could. Kevin said West Marsh's games have one GM and a bunch of rotating players. See, now I've heard from other people saying that they have multiple GMs. And their West Marches. So, and that uh, they're open to, like, anybody online. And it's kind of like, like, that's why I'm saying where it sounds like, okay, in theory it sounds cool. But in execution, I don't know. So, Kevin says, games happen when a group of players decide they want to do something. Explore an area 
look for a treasure, fight a monster, etc. Like I said, I'm not overly familiar with the concept of the West Marshes. And then the funny thing, too, is I always kind of mix that up with the Wilderlands, or Wilderlands, if you want to pronounce it that way, which was kind of the first hex crawl for D&D from Judges Guild way back in the day. So here we've got all this info if you wanted to play as a Gripply. And then we get uh, stat blocks for them as well. Nice. I will say that the world map is a little bland. But that's to kind of be expected with it using hexes. The Ice Cave of the Yetis. So this is actually up in the upper north. So it was kind of funny taking a look at the breakdown of the issues. It was sort of, uh, it looked like something like issue seven was up in the, the northern wastes or whatever. And, and then it changed to the other area and then it goes back to, to up there. It was like, oh, okay. So Kogo B says they played in an index card RPG West Marshes style game for a bit before they had to take a hiatus. And there were several DMs. They had a Discord server with a lot of chat going on to figure everything out. So Kevin points out, yep, some people might have multiple GMs, but it's not required. See, and the thing is, I don't think it would be all that difficult to run if it's a single GM and you have multiple groups. All you got to do is keep track of the different groups. I wouldn't think you could run a bunch. I certainly wouldn't be somebody who'd be like, okay, well, it's uh, seven different groups, one each night. That'd be pretty crazy. So just kind of taking a look on through. I think we'll actually go in depth and we'll take a look at issue eight from start to finish to give you a oh now this we jumped to issue 12 oh i get why it's so we still have the same area so we're still in the same area because as i had mentioned it the issues jumped okay so here's issue eight so it's the haunted hills and showing where the location is there. It's like we've got two areas of interest. So it says, four cycles ago, this region of these Zalai? Zalaya? Let's say Zalaya. Steps was dominated by nomadic tribes of humans. Fierce warriors that rode upon fast and spry ponies. For a brief period, during the apex of the 12th cycle, the tribes were united by a strong leader. But as so often happens, the empire fell apart upon her death, and combined with the following nadir, the nomads fell upon hard times, with many of them moving farther south. So let's see what we've got here. Just looking to see... Okay, so I guess it, it's more kind of just talking about how uh, that the nomads fell into hard times and they're actually not really around anymore. So Jonathan Spencer has joined us. Welcome aboard. So our two locations are Shrine to Izumga and the Disenchanter. So the shrine is located in the subhex, the only visible sign, an enormous yellow rib that juts out of the ground atop a grassy rise. Yes, in this, they were talking about some, like, giant skeletons. So 
than the disenchanter, a strange creature has taken up residence in this subhex, drawn by the subtle magic of Izumga that pervades the area. Frustratingly for it, the disenchanter cannot divine the source of the magical energy, and it grows hungry. Yes, because it's now going to be looking for the player character's magic items to feed on. So we get our, our wandering monsters. So we've got six. So we have the disenchanter is one of them. Uh, 1d4 giant hawks, 1d6 killer bees, 1d3 ragosdizia. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what those are. And 1d4 saber tooth cats. And then the sound of stampeding elephants coming from around a bend, which grows louder and louder before suddenly ending. Upon investigation, there's nothing there. It's the ghosts of those giant creatures. So right here, it says, uh, Absalom is littered with the ghosts of forgotten gods, would-be divinities, and the spirits of creatures so puissant that they linger for cycles after death. Little guy Gaxian in here, isn't it? These beings, known as vestiges, exist outside of physical and magical laws and yearn for the ability to experience the world as they once knew it. Oh, it's giving you the option of playing as one of these binders? That's what it looks like. Oh, okay. So here we go. Certain individuals known as binders have learned how to strike packs with these beings, inviting them to share a mortal body for a brief period of time. There we go. I was going to say, sharing rules to be a ghost. So here we have the vestiges. So it looks like we've got uh, quite a bit of information about these vestiges. We have different abilities that can be granted by them. Print-only bonus text. So I guess... Guess if you get the print edition, uh, sometimes there might be bonus text. So I thought we would get. Did we somehow miss? I don't think so. The shrine. I thought the shrine would be well. Maybe the shrine's just a locale as opposed to being like a someplace for a dungeon delve. All right. This is, this is very interesting. I, I'll tell you, you can see it is packed with goodies. And you can easily take what you'd like. Oh, look, a map of a town. That's cool. And it doesn't seem like Every issue is kind of like the same old, same old. It looks like each issue is something different. The Lake of the Dead. And then, so this is, this is a location here. Oh, okay. So here we go. So this is a locale. Rules for spider stalking. Oh, that must be what this is here. So he rolled dice. There must be this must be a location full of spiders or something. So yeah, so this is a dungeon location. What do the spiders do? And then we've got an appendix. So here. Once again, more optional rules. Wounds. The following system can be used to add a gritty, more realistic feel to combat. It introduces the idea of wounds. Injuries that result from massive damage from a single source, brushes with death, or other potentially body-shattering events. <laughs> like, 
getting uh, an arrow and a knife and a spear punched through you. Okay, so then we got player maps. And then some other items that are from Third Kingdom Games. Because I think Third Kingdom Games also publishes other creators' products, not only their own. So that's a first look at Populated Hexes Monthly, the first year from Third Kingdom Games. Once again, this is available in PDF over at Drive Through RPG for $18.95. You can order the soft cover like you see here for $30.95 or grab the hardcover for $35.95. And of course, you can subscribe the next populated hex monthly coming out will be February 1st. And you can subscribe if you want the physical releases for $81.95 for 12 months or grab the PDFs for $23.95. So there you have that. Swing on over to the other camera. So I was going to say, here we go. I'll, sh I'll show you what we've got. This will be next week. But these are the other items that were sent along from Third Kingdom Games. We have the BX Advanced Bestiary Volume 1. And then we have Filling in the Blanks, which I've actually heard quite a bit about. Uh, and this is how to create a hex map. So how to populate a hex map. So uh, like I said, I have heard about this. It is supposed to be really good for those out there who, of course, dig the OSR. So we're going to look at both of these next week. So we'll actually, we'll do one, one episode, but we'll look at both. Like I, I did the little bonus for the introduction to Absalom for the populated hexes monthly. So there was quite a bit going on this weekend. So you may have caught my first episode of the classic Cthulhu case files, where I tackled the first adventure from the Shadows of Yug Sothoth campaign from all the way back in 1982, which I owned and I ran. So check that out. It's not a long video, it's only about 12 minutes or so. I also reviewed the first chapter in the new. Pathfinder Adventure Path Gatewalkers. So it is the seventh arch. So I went into detail about that. Sammy wrapped up her review of the latest Starfinder Adventure Path and the first chapter of the one that just kicked off. So those are available as well. And later this week, be sure to tune in when I share why you should play index card role-playing game. So that will be this month's edition of Why You Should Play. So let's cook in the rest of the week. So on tomorrow's show, we are going to dive in. We're going to take a look at Wasson, A Wicked Secret, and Other Mysteries. Yes, that's right. I remembered the title for a change. I know I keep wanting to say Wicked Secrets. It is A Wicked Secret. Singular. So that's on tomorrow's show. Then on Wednesday's show, we are going to take a look at Fantasy Hero Complete from Hero Games. So the fine folks over at Hero Games sent this along. So we're going to dive on into this core book. Of course, this is from the same folks who published Champions, the superhero role-playing game. Then, next Monday, a week from today, uh, as long as things don't change, I'm going to unbox and take a look at the Grizzled Armistice Edition from Cool Mini or Not, which I picked up over at Tabletop Games Shop in Oswego, Illinois, 
for a song. So this is probably on the agenda for Monday next week. If not, maybe it'll get pushed back to Wednesday for a war game Wednesday. But uh, yes, I swung on over to Tabletop Game Shop because they had some Arkham Horror expansions, the latest edition of Arkham Horror, which Elliot is a huge fan of. And he, they had actually, they had all three on clearance, but he had one. He had the most recent one, but he didn't have the other two. So I swung on over and, and picked them up for a song for him. So, so I think I'll probably swing in there every couple of weeks or so and see if there's anything that catches my eye in their clearance from companies that I normally don't re do reviews of for stuff. So Flaming Heron says, funny enough, there's a bundle for Hero 6E, which kicked off today. Uh, yeah, it must have been this afternoon because I actually took a peek at Bundle of Holding earlier uh, this morning to see if there was anything new, and there wasn't. Badman said they had a lot of fun playing the Grizzled. It's frequently requested for him to bring. Cool. Very nice. And, of course, this one actually has the painted minis. That's why it is the Armistice Edition, I believe. I've never played it. I had seen it when it first came out, and I was interested and checking it out. Forget who it, who it was from. I know it wasn't originally Cool Mini or not. I'm 95% sure that was not the case. So, lots cooking. Got a lot going on. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like the video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And of course, if you do subscribe, don't forget, Ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when the dispatch streams live Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. I'll also let you know when I upload other videos such as my recent review of the 7th Arch. I almost said gate. The 7th Arch for Pathfinder from Paizo Inc. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. If you watch live, thank you very much for tuning in. If you watched live and took part in chat, big tip of the cap, because not only are you keeping me company, you're keeping each other company as well, and that is much appreciated. But, of course, I know a lot of people out there, you don't have an opportunity to watch live. doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you to each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy life to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. Everybody enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it might happen to be in your neck of the woods. Hopefully you're not dealing with a lot of crappy weather, but if so, stay safe. Number one, stay safe. And here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.